Welcome to part two of working with electronic documents. This is the second in a series of four videos which has been prepared for LEAD, the Legal Education Division of the Law Society of South Africa. Part one was a very basic look at electronic document formats and the benefits and pitfalls of working with electronic documents. In part two, we discuss a slightly more interesting concept, encryption. What is it, why we can trust it, and what it can be used for. Let's first have a look at three acts that have a bearing on working with electronic documents and working with information in general. The Electronic Communications and Transactions Act, or ECT Act, number 25 of 2002, was a milestone in acknowledging the value of electronic documents. Its central message is that electronic documents are indeed legal. Documents often include very sensitive and personal information, such as people's names, their ID numbers, contact details, addresses, financial status, and even health history. It is therefore important to keep in mind that the Poppy Act requires us to treat personal information of others responsibly. Because of the ease with which electronic documents can be copied and shared, special care is needed to stay within the requirements of the Poppy Act. Few people seem to realize how insecure email is and how easily documents sent via email can leak out. Sending documents which include personal information via email is not treating such information responsibly, especially when the document is sent either from or to an email address that is offered as a free service. Such free email service providers often reserve the right, as part of their terms and conditions, to access and use the information in these email messages. Using otherwise secure services such as Dropbox may also be problematic. The Poppy Act requires a written agreement to be in place when using a service provider outside of South African borders, where the agreement states that the service provider will treat personal information according to the requirements of the South African Poppy Act. Whereas the Poppy Act talks about negligent and accidental leaking of information, the RICA Act focuses more on deliberate and malicious actions. In a nutshell, it says, do not eavesdrop, unless, of course, you're the government, in which case you have the right to do so. Let's have a look at the intention of the ECT Act. It is to provide for the facilitation and regulation of electronic communications and transactions. There is a handful of technical terms in the ECT Act. It's probably a good idea to have some understanding of these terms when it comes to the interpretation of the Act. The first term we encounter is cryptography. Related terms are encryption and decryption. Another term found in the ECT Act is digital certificate. To understand the Act, it's important to know what a digital certificate is. Section 37 of the ECT Act refers to the Accreditation Authority. Who is the authority and what is its purpose? In the definition section, the Act refers to an electronic signature and also to an advanced electronic signature. What is the difference between an electronic signature and an advanced electronic signature? To summarize, the ECT Act 25 of 2002 uses terms such as cryptography, digital certificate, South African Accreditation Authority, electronic signature and advanced electronic signature. One of the aims of this video series is to provide you with a basic understanding of these slightly more technical terms that we find in the Act. Let's start by looking at what cryptography means and how it works. Encryption is the process of converting information or data into a code, specifically to prevent unauthorized access. In simple terms, it is equivalent to using a key to lock a document. We can start with an open document of which the content is visible. We can then use a key and an encryption process to lock the document by making it impossible to view the content. Decryption is the inverse process of encryption, which again allows access to the information. Decryption uses the same key used for locking to again unlock the information. If we start with an encrypted or locked document, we can decrypt the document by using the exact same key with which the document was locked to make the contents visible again. This all sounds very abstract, so let's have a look at a simple example of how this can be done. There are many encryption and decryption techniques. One very old and simple technique is called the Caesar Code. Legend has it that this encryption technique was used by Julius Caesar when he sent orders to distant generals. Like many encryption techniques, the Caesar Code required Caesar 
to have a secret code or key with each general. Instructions such as whether to attack or retreat could be sent by a soldier on horseback knowing that the message would not leak out should the soldier be caught by the enemy. Encrypting a message using the Caesar code is very easy. Simply replace each letter in the message with a letter that is further down in the alphabet. How far down is the secret key? In the example shown here, the key is 2, which means that every A in the message is replaced by a C, and every B is replaced by a D. The result is that the meaning of the message seems lost and the message becomes a secret. To decrypt the message, the opposite is done. Every letter in the secret message is replaced by another letter in the alphabet. In this case, with the key being equal to 2, every C will be replaced with an A, every D will be replaced with a B, and so forth. It is clear that using a different key than what was used for encryption will not work. Only someone who knows the key with which the message was encrypted will be able to unlock the message. Now for a challenge. This slide shows an encrypted or secret message. Pause the video and see if you can break the code and decrypt the message. One way to do this would be to simply try all possible keys. I'm sure if you tried to break the code, you would agree that it was fairly easy. This is because we have chosen the key to be 1, expecting you to start with 1 when trying different keys. You can imagine that it would have taken slightly longer to break this code if the key was, for example, 12. If you did not pause on the previous slide, maybe do so now and study how a key of 1 easily reveals the message. Just to make sure you understand the encryption and decryption process, here is an example of encrypting the same message with a different key, 3 in this case. Notice how the encrypted or coded message is completely different from the one in the case where the key was equal to 1. The Caesar code was a simple example, just to show you how a physical concept such as locking with a key can be applied to information. Real-world encryption is, of course, much more complex and more difficult to break than this. It is important to know that not all encryption techniques use a single key. There is also a two-key encryption technique. It is called public key encryption and works with the following two keys. A private key, which is kept secret, and a public key, which is shared with others. When a message is locked with one key, it can only be unlocked with the other key, and vice versa. The public key is, for example, used to check the validity of an electronic signature. We have already mentioned that encryption is used to add trust to documents. It should be clear that any security feature such as the confidentiality of a document that relies on the strength of the encryption process would not add any trust if it can be broken as easily as the Caesar code. Let's have a look at how easy it would be for an intruder or hacker to compromise the security of an encrypted document. For the type of encryption currently used in real-world systems, we assume that the hacker has the encrypted document, we assume that the hacker knows the encryption method, and that all security is based on keeping the key a secret. In this situation, one option the hacker has would be to try all possible keys. Short keys have very few possible combinations. The longer the key, the more possible keys there are. The more keys, the longer it would take to try all the keys until the correct one is found. This is called a brute force attack. Let's look at the Caesar code and compare this to real-world encryption. There are 26 letters in the alphabet. This means that in the Caesar code, we can use replacement letters by shifting letters right in the alphabet one place up to 25 places before we run out of letters. The Caesar code can therefore use keys from 1 to 25 which means there are a maximum of 25 keys. If we assume it takes a person 5 minutes to try and decrypt a message with a specific key, it would take about 2 hours to try all the keys and break the code. In real-world encryption, on the other hand, the key length is about 50 to 100 characters long. Even for a key of only 50 characters, there are about 10 to the power of 60 possible keys. This is a very large number a 1 with 60 following zeros. If we assume the hacker has a very powerful computer that can test 1 billion keys every second to see if it's the correct key, it would take 10 to the power of 43 years for the hacker to test all keys and find the correct key. 
This is a 1 with 43 zeros following. Still an impossibly large number to even write down. In comparison, the universe is said to be just over 10 to the power of 10 years old. As you can see, modern encryption provides a very, very strong defense against someone breaking the security by guessing a key. It will take much, much longer than any secret ever has to be protected. But of course, there are more ways in which hackers can break in. If we look at the security vulnerabilities of documents, we will find a spectrum of levels on which an intruder can attack. On this slide, the levels which you do not have to worry about are colored in green, while the levels which you should be concerned about have been colored red. The mathematics on which information security is based is very secure. This is the green line right at the bottom. Mathematicians are able to prove the security associated with a specific algorithm and key length. You can completely trust the security of mathematics. But the mathematical algorithms are implemented in software and the software implementation cannot be proven to be correct with the same vigor as the mathematical algorithms can. Programmers can make mistakes. But all software can rigorously be tested before being made available. And even while in use, patches to security vulnerabilities can be released and installed. The software is usually fairly secure. The next level, which starts turning orange, is the level on which IT specialists have to ensure that information systems are correctly installed and maintained. If done well, it can be very secure, but it relies on discipline, procedures, and supervision to maintain the security level. Much less secure is the level where end users become part of the solution. A major source of insecurity is user ignorance. Users tend to use systems to generate and communicate documents without knowing or understanding what the implications are. For example, when having to merge two PDF documents, a user may simply search the internet for a free online service and upload the documents without realizing that this may cause sensitive personal information of clients to leak out. However, even when users do know and understand the security issues, they are often careless. They may, for example, know and understand the risks of sending a document containing personal client information via email, but don't care enough to rather use a secure document delivery service. Finally, right at the top we find social vulnerabilities. Intruders cannot always rely on users to be ignorant or careless when they want to launch a targeted attack. However, human relationships are very vulnerable. Humans are easily deceived. When looking for access to sensitive information, the easiest method could be to befriend a person or to blackmail someone. This is so much easier than trying to break the mathematics or find holes in the software that this is where we are most vulnerable for attacks. This was part two in a series of four videos. Part one touched on the most basic concepts of working with electronic documents. In part two, we mainly discussed encryption, how it works and why we can trust it, and the security it provides. Make sure that you also watch parts 3 and 4 in this video series.